Hey Sevens, welcome to lesson 2.4, France Expands Its Empire. Today we will learn how were the first permanent French colonies established in North America. So stick around and let's learn something. Lesson 2.4, how were the first permanent French colonies established in North America? In our last lesson, we met this individual, Cartier, Jacques Cartier, and he came to uh, North America on a few voyages, but ultimately the settlement that he tried to create failed. But the idea of having this empire, the idea to having these settlements in North America, the idea of having these colonies was very much alive and well. The idea uh, still existed. And annually, the French, they would come off of the coast um, to fish each year. The fur traders still came and they were trading goods with the First Nations. But eventually, they build these colonies and these colonies become uh, successful colonies. So because of the demand for fur was growing exponentially in the 1600s, King Louis XIII decides that it is now time to get a colony set up and running because there's this abundance of furs in, the, in North America. So King Louis, okay, he sees this abundance of furs, but you know from previous lessons, anybody in power always wants more power. And if France has more colonies than England, then France will be uh, the bigger empire. So more colonies equals a bigger empire. And remember from previous lessons, the Europeans are always at war with each other. And it was a constant thing, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So then they, you know, you have more colonies, your empire obviously is bigger. The more colonies you have, and we saw this um, in, uh, in previous lessons as well, the more colonies you have means you have access to more resources. And if you have more resources, then you have a military advantage over your opponents. But there's a problem here. Colonies are extremely expensive. So the king, Louis XIII, he's like, well, let somebody else pay for those colonies. So what King Louis did is he granted a monopoly to merchants. So what a monopoly is, what it means in, in this example, you've all played the game Monopoly. The, the, the object of the game is to have as much property as possible bankrupt your uh, opponents. Well, it's kind of a similar idea here that the French king was using. He granted a monopoly to uh, French merchants and only those merchants were able to sell their goods in France uh, from the colonies, so from the fur trade, which was a huge deal. And if you remember, people wanted these fashion accessories. Um, like the fur coats and the beaver pelt hats. So only those French merchants who were approved by the king could sell these goods. In turn, to have these monopolies, the French merchants would then have to pay to have successful colonies. So in 1604, Pierre de Mont granted a monopoly from the French king. He is the handsome individual in the top left hand side there. And he took along the other handsome individual in the top right hand side, Samuel de Champlain, a map maker. He took him with him in 1604. They settled in 1605 at Port Royal on the Bay of Fundy. You can see here on the map. And they called it Acadia, which is a Greek word meaning earthly, paradise. Now think back all the way to chapter one. Who was already in this area in terms of our first nations? Was it the Anishinaabe, the Mi'kmaq, or the Haudenosaunee? If you're thinking Mi'kmaq, good job. It was. The Mi'kmaq welcomed the French because the French left them alone for the most part. And the Mi'kmaq enjoyed having the French there as well because it gave them new items to trade for. So the French were bringing medals and blankets, and in exchange, um, the French were getting much needed fur for the fur trade, because remember the monopoly that the merchants had, they wanted to sell these furs. And the Mi'kmaq the Mi had no problem sharing the land with the French, as long as the Mi'kmaq still had access to the hunting and fishing that they always had access to. 
this is a time of safety. Things are safe. Business in France is booming. French people see this, so the French keep coming to the new world. Because in Europe, life was hard. So you might as well, if life is hard, what does it matter where you are? If you're in France or if you're in Europe, life is going to be difficult anyways. So at least you can come to Acadia. You still have a hard life, but at least it's a new opportunity. It's a new opportunity for a new start to the poor French farmers who were living in Europe at the time. They're like, well, you know what? We might as well go make something new of ourselves over in Acadia. And the colonists, uh, as they were coming over, a lot of them were coming, they set up all these uh, settlements along the shores of the Bay of Fundy, where they were fishing, they were farming, they were hunting, they were gathering resources to send back to the home country. And these uh, first French colonists, they become the first Acadians. We will learn more about the Acadians later in, in, in future chapters, um, but uh, for now, these are the first Acadians. Acadians. But there was a problem at the Bay of Fundy. It was too far from the fur trade. The fur trade was further up along the St. Lawrence River, and Port Royal was just too far from that. So even though it was working, it would have been better situated closer to the actual fur trade where it was happening. So Demont and Champlain, they moved up to the St. Lawrence, and they settled near Stadacona, and they named this settlement uh, Quebec which is an Algonquin word for where the river narrows. So it becomes almost like a bottleneck uh, at this point here in Quebec, uh, where Quebec City is today. Um, it's, a, it's a bottleneck, so you can see easy to defend uh, if they needed to. So they're thinking long way down the way. And Quebec was the ideal place for the fur trade. It was where the river narrows. Uh, they had access to the water. First Nations, many different First Nations were coming to, to Quebec to trade in the fur trade. So this was the perfect place. Although it was ideal for the fur trade, it was far from ideal to live in. And of the 28 newcomers that came to settle Quebec, 20 of them died. They died in that first winter. That, that Quebec winter is a brutal winter. If you've ever been to Quebec in the winter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is very unlike our winters here. The humidity just makes makes it so much colder. And 20 of the 28, they died. There was a they died because of the weather, and they died from a lack of food. Still, eight remained. They kept the settlement. In terms of what Cartier did, this is still a success because this settlement goes on to to thrive eventually. We met Samuel de Champlain, or we briefly talked about him. And Samuel de Champlain, he is this map maker, and uh, he went on with Dumont, uh, the, the merchant, brought him along. And he lived in Quebec for 27 years. That's a very long time. Quebec started as a settlement. He helped start this settlement. There was absolutely nothing there for the French, so they had to build it up. He returned and he went back and forth to France eight times to get colonists to come over and to uh, to sell the idea of Quebec to the colonists, to these French farmers, and he kept bringing these people over. He worked very hard with First Nations. He built alliances with the Montagne and the Algonquin. He made it all the way to the Great Lakes where he met uh, the Wendat people. And he helped the Wendat fight against the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee, if you remember from the previous lesson, they could not stand the French because remember, Cartier took ten of their uh, ten of their men, including Don Cana, who was a leader of the Haudenosaunee, back to Europe for a number of years, where nine out of ten of them died. And when Cartier came back. He lied to the Haudenosaunee. So the Haudenosaunee kept this uh, feeling even when Champlain made it over and there was this, this hostility between the French and the Haudenosaunee. And the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat did not get along. And that's why Champlain became allies with the Wendat. And the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee raided each other constantly. So they raided each other's... Um, 
settlements and areas for furs. They were attacking each other to revenge the death of relatives. Um, and they were also at war with each other because the Haudenosaunee knew that the Wendat were uh, in alliance with the French and they couldn't stand the French. And this conflict lasted for the next 100 years. And when there's conflict, life is going to be unstable. And if life is unstable, it's very difficult to focus on anything else but safety. Um, and you'll see that because of this unstable life, in Quebec, for example, they build uh, they build a fortress in a few in Quebec and a few other French uh, areas um, to protect them from these raids that the Haudenosaunee were doing against the French and the Wendat. And in 1635, Champlain dies on Christmas Day in Quebec, and he is now known as the Father of New France. And this is a picture, not a, this picture is of a, a statue that he has in Quebec City, just outside of Chateau Frontenac. Um, they have this statue there to commemorate the Father of New France, Samuel de Champlain. Okay, head over and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.